Where you been? And she love me when I'm in it. And she never be pretending. Not in this ring. She gon' tell you what she bought it. Cause she know you can't afford it. Know you can get it. Looking exquisite. No competition. Stay on the pivot. Hope be watching. They be plotting. She's so motherfucking independent. Mama be beat. Got on her grind. She had to get out her mama house. Daddy be tripping. Now she be whipping. Ain't no more on no granny couch. Fashion over. Got that air looking different. Make me wanna put her all in my mentions. Feeling like she was. Well, hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the East Spot with Camille. I'm your host, Camille Cower, and I am so excited for you guys to meet my guest today. She is the CEO, founder, publicist from the She Group, um, Connie Chi, and she's also an entrepreneur. She's worked in several different industries. I am very excited about meeting her and can't wait for you guys to meet her as well. She's had an amazing TED Talk, and let's just hear her talk, shall we? Hi, welcome, Connie. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, you know, it's important to learn the people behind the people that we're interviewing. You know, like how do they get these opportunities and learn more from the people who give it to them? Because some of these questions they don't know the answers to because they have a great team behind them that's doing all the, the work for them. So I thank you for coming behind the car, um, the, <laughs> the curtain and sharing all your great uh, information that you have about being a publicist. So I'm very oh, excited. absolutely. Absolutely. So for those of you who don't know, I actually have um, a PR agency. It's called the Chi Group. And we work with inspirational personalities and talents. And my favorite is always telling the story about the underdog. Mm -hmm. The rags to riches story is always our favorite types of clients that we like to work with. I have a TEDx talk out there, as you said, it's called Lonely AF, Lonely About Failure. And I just finished my second book called Overachieving AF, right? So Overachieving Failure and the Lessons It Teaches You. And I'm also the publicist for, Camille, I'm sure you know, Sergio Delavici, who is an actor in John Wick 3. Yeah, so I loved interviewing him, by the way, so. Yeah, he was great, he was yeah. great. It was a lot of fun. Now, what, how did you get started in publicity? Like what, what about publicity intrigued you to be like, this is what I want to do for a career. Was it something you majored in college? Like when did that start for you? It was an accidental thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Most so great things are. <laughs> exactly. Right. So I started out and um, I actually corporate life was 16 years working in the diamond wholesale diamond mining company. Okay. So my corporate job was essentially carrying around 6.5 millions worth of diamonds mm -hmm. and traveling throughout the United States. I would sell it to companies like Cartier, Van Cleef and our pals. Okay. Back then, up. How did you yeah. get started into that? Like even that's fascinating. And that was I, also an accident. <laughs> And it's a girl's best friend, so we must talk about this diamond industry you work yeah. in. Yeah, fascinating. So where were I you started, traveling with that as well? Yeah, I mean, I've traveled Canada, I've traveled Texas, Cali, Florida, Miami. The craziest one for me was West Virginia. Hmm. I was completely petrified there because at that time, this was pre nine eleven. When I went okay. down there. I didn't realize it, but it was my first trip out and I get out of the airport and I see like all these Confederate flags flying all over the place. Mm. And I'm the only Asian person who arrives at the airport. So, you know, we New Yorkers are like chic and like, you know, the, the Versace sunglasses and, you know, and all of a sudden you come off the plane and everyone's looking at you like you don't belong here. Yeah. So and that's not a very welcoming flag to see when you're um I was petrified. <laughs> yeah. I was petrified. Understandable. Petrified. Understandable. So, yeah. you know, I basically started as a counter person in retail at Lord and Taylor. Okay. And from there kind of worked my rank worked my way up the ranks. And eventually, you know, I was going to college in the city and I'm just like, I need to get a like real adult job. So <laughs> So it's like, I don't know anything else but diamonds. So I took a shot and landed a gig out on 47th Street, which is the Diamond District in New York. Yeah. And what was really fascinating was my first day there at a diamond mining company. They're like, sit down, you're going to open up boxes. I'm like, I have a college degree. I'm going to open up boxes, really? So you're opening up boxes and it's diamonds taped to the inside of FedEx boxes you know, UPS boxes. And your job, my job at that time was literally to 
take it out, check to see if there was any cracks in the stone, if it was chipped, if it was the right stone, if it was a match to the certification. Okay. And essentially that was what I did for like maybe two, two years and change until one day I accidentally threw away a $10,000 diamond. Okay, how does that happen? Because it's, they're really small, right? They're yeah. really small compared to like the box and you're going through like 30, 50 boxes a day. So mm. you can imagine how easy it is to just kind of lose a stone. And when I realized I lost the stone, because when you sign on to a job like this, they say if you lose any stones or if um, it, you get robbed, they will garnish your paycheck until the stone's fully paid for or the merchandise fully paid for. And on yeah. top of that, they take double life insurance out on you because if God forbid something happens, they get paid out and your family gets paid out. And oh. then they do a full credit check, right? So you have to have like really good credit. Oh, yeah. And then I got interviewed by an ex FBI agent. So essentially I threw out that stone and I'm just like, I'm crying. And this is a building that had about 25 floors. I went dumpster diving for this freaking stone. And I went through people's lunches and like garbage bags. I was in tears oh, just yeah. looking for this $10,000 stone. I found it. I found oh. it and I cried. And that was it. I was like, I, I can't do this. I can't keep opening up boxes. This yeah. isn't. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Kudos to finding it. Especially right. like I did not expect for that to be this where the story was going to go since you quit, <laughs> right? Like it was like, I'm paying $10,000 and <laughs> y'all can have it. Um, but. Wow, that yeah. be, I mean, and it's that New York was, City, yeah. and that's a yeah. lot of uh, that's a lot of people's garbage that you were yeah. going through. Yeah, yeah, I realized what people had for lunch, and like it was like gross. And I was in a full suit, right? And I'm like in a Banana Republic suit, and I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe I'm in a dumpster in heels. Yeah. Oh, so that but was the start it. of my career yeah. in the diamond industry. That lasted about 16 years. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So you left there. What did you do for the other 14? Because So, you know, boxes. Yeah. after that, I'm sitting there and I'm just like, well, you know, they get paid out if anything happens to me. And I'm traveling with 6.5 million. It's not my, it's not even my merchandise. Mm -hmm. And it's to the point where I have to babysit an entire handbag worth of diamonds. <sighs> So I'm like, I can't live like this. You're constantly looking over your shoulder. They're telling you, you know, things to do to not get followed because we're targets, right? Mm. You don't have a bodyguard. You don't have a weapon. And you're traveling like this. With 6.5 million. 6.5 million. Yeah. And that's in the handbag. And then on your body, you obviously will wear some as well because there's certain stipulations. Like, if, for example, you go into Canada, there's a cutoff on how much you can bring. Okay. So in order to go around that cutoff, you would wear the rest on your body <laughs> to avoid the, you know. I'm like thinking of every like um, drug movie where they're like taping. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm imagining it diamond crystal, like, wow, who knew? Yeah. I'm learning so much. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, at one point I had to cross the border with, I think it was like 185,000 on my neck, right? And then on my ears was about 35,000. And then in the bag was about 3.5 million. So that's how I was like crossing borders and stuff. Yeah, it was definitely a fun adventure. Yeah. Definitely a fun adventure. I have stories for days from that industry. I mean, I remember it, I saw one time they made a deal, you know, a sale of a stone with a handshake. And it was a $30,000 stone. The next day, the gentleman comes in with a duffel bag filled with cash and then dumps it on the table. And that was it. They were done. Payment was made. <laughs> yeah, see, yeah, it's funny. So my cousin, he's a chef on he, with these different yacht companies and he'll yeah. travel around on vacation. Well, people are on vacations on these yachts and he's their personal chef. And he was telling me one of the people he worked for was, I want to say they were Russian and they... Um, they might or they owned a diamond company and he was just talking about how loosely they were with money mm -hmm. and stuff and mm -hmm. yeah, that's he, normal yeah so hearing your story is just like oh yeah diamond people of course yeah <laughs> exactly and then the thing is you get jaded right because mm -hmm. every year we had to as salespeople, we had to travel to vegas for seven days and seven days we would at these shows it's diamond shows and let me tell you camille you would see diamonds from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And it was a trade show that was the size of like three football fields. 
in one hotel and then there was another one in another hotel. So it's seven days like this and you saw like five carat D flawless, 25 carats, yellow stones, orange diamonds, yeah. like you name it, rough stones, polished stones. It was insane, insane. And they would put you up in the hotel at the win, right? Cause you're salespeople, you need to stay close by put you in the wind and your job was to walk the show, get customers. And at nighttime you take potential customers out for dinner. They're like, here's a credit card, swipe away. Fun. Okay. Fun. That Lots sounds like fun. a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun spending on somebody else's expense account right. <laughs> and right. somewhere in Vegas where you can really ball out. <laughs> right. As opposed to uh, living in Cary, like here, you take a credit card. Oh, great. I can go to Target. Right. Now <laughs> it's like, can you can, can yeah. we use a coupon, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I have to ask because so many people right now, because I know a girlfriend of mine just proposed to her um, beau as well, but what are some of the things people should look for in diamonds? I know I did a commercial a long time ago for a jewelry company and it was like the three C's is what matters when it comes to diamonds, cut, carrot, clarity. There we go. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. Right. Right. But you're asking a diamond snob, right? Yeah. So what should like what should girls so, really go for? Should it be personally? I yeah. will say always go for a round stone because a round stone has resale value and it will retain its value more so than let's say a square stone. Okay. And you know, for the stones, you always want like a triple excellent, triple excellent stones. It means excellent cut, excellent clarity, excellent you know throughout the the certificate. So that way it also is easier to sell it down the line, right? So the running joke in the diamond industry is you always want to get a round stone that's triple X, you know, because in case you get a divorce and you don't get to settle, you always sell the stone. <laughs> I guess I'm stuck. I have an emerald. Darn. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, round I stones are always okay. the way to go. Um, you know, you definitely, every woman is different, but for me, it's very important, the color and the clarity. Okay. And, you know, sometimes there's a variation in pricing. So if you want to get your significant other, let's say a VS1 stone, that's the clarity, you can actually get them a VS2 and pay a couple of thousand less, okay. you know, or let's say if your significant other wanted like a two carat stone and you get them a carat and 75 or a carat eight, you know, that's shy of two carat, but that will save you sometimes even 10 grand. Mm. Well, thanks for those tips. Just in case people yeah. are out there wanting to get some bling bling. Then yeah. we're getting it from the expert who uh, worked 16 years in the diamond industry. So at what point did you go from diamond industry to publicity? I think the point was when I had this like aha moment when I realized they profit off my death. I'm like, that's mm -hmm. just, that, that was it. I was like, you know what? I was unhappy. I was working for someone else's dreams. I was guarding pieces of rocks that wasn't mine. Right. So I was like, I'm going to start my own company. And mm -hmm. my biggest mistake was I started a company because it was trending. Mm -hmm. Right. So never start businesses because it's trending. Okay. And because of that, I ended up with three failed businesses, all because I was just not even familiar how to get started and why and how. So my first business, I thought I wanted to be a life coach. Okay. Well, I quickly I learned life coaches. Yeah. I can't do it because I just can't do it. Listening yeah. to people's problems, 365 days, like I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't. So I closed that down and I was like, you know what? I've been in luxury. I'm going to do concierge services, right? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Sounds kind of nice, swanky. But here's the thing, Camille. I had no idea what concierge did. No clue. So that was done. And then I turned around, I'm like, well, what'd you go to school for? I went to school for marketing, right? So I'm going to start a marketing agency for yoga studios. And the problem mm -hmm. is yoga studios, they don't necessarily have that extra revenue to outsource third party for marketing, okay. right? So that was like done. And then I just I launched this agency and I'm just like, you know what? I cannot, it's like having three divorces, right? I'm like, I can't mm -hmm. have three divorces right now and like and not learn anything from this. Hey, J-Lo's done it. Elizabeth Taylor has done it. You, yeah. you marry the wrong one, the next one's coming around. 
right? Well, so, get out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> exactly. So I started this agency and it okay. just started as a general marketing agency and morphed its way into PR because a lot of our clients were like, why don't you do publicity for us? Can you do publicity for us? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, it's scary to just one day pick up your business and be like, we now do publicity, mm -hmm. but we used to do marketing, right? So, you know, I, I, I feel like they go so much hand in hand marketing publicity. I mean, I mean from just, the outside but yeah to some degree yes okay. but also the difference is PR is focused primarily on you know press broadcast media news you know pitching those for your clients where marketing is how do I get customers to buy from me okay right so it's a little bit different yeah so that's how I kind of landed here where I am now Oh, that sounds like a fun journey. And like, so one of the comments actually says there are no accidents. So no, it's a good one. Yeah. Well, so you started your publicity business. How long has it been now? So this agency is three years old, three years young, right? <laughs> three years young. And we've been doing PR for about like a year and a half now okay. currently with this. And you've done some books in between. One is about your failed businesses, but I don't want, I mean, yeah. I don't like when people call things failures because you're learning from them. It's a failure only if you didn't learn from it and you just kept doing it. Then I feel right. like, okay, you're right. kind of failing over there. But, right. you know, if you learn from it and decide, oh, this is not meant for me and move on. And especially since you started some such a successful business on afterwards. But what, what, um, what encouraged you to write the books? Well, you know, in the second grade, one of my dreams was to be an author. And my entire family at the second grade laughed me out the room. So oh, no. <laughs> kind of killed my little dream, right, at, in the second grade. So as I've gotten to, to be an adult, I'm like, you know what? Let me just try this out. Mm. You know, let me just try this out. The first book I wrote is called Branding Without a Brand. How do you create a brand when nobody really knows you? Mm -hmm. And the second book I wrote is Overachieving AF, which is a little bit more about, you know, as an overachiever, what did I learn through my failures and how do we overachieve failing, right? Mm -hmm. And I wrote those books just to kind of share with people and let them know that, like, you don't have to struggle alone. Mm -hmm. You know, I think entrepreneurs, we end up, we walk this really lonely road because not many people understand why we're crazy enough to chase our dreams with little money in the beginning mm -hmm. and why we're willing to sacrifice sleep and all the other things. And when we have that like moment of like success, it's like, who can we share it with? And you realize you scroll through the phone. Wow. There's no one I can call. Yeah. Or, you know, you have a question about entrepreneurship and it's like, who do I talk to? Mm -hmm. You know, so I just wanted people to know that, like, these are resources. They're really real, raw, you know, insights into my own mind of what I was thinking, what I went through, how I reacted to it, what I did, and some takeaways that people can kind of just use if it helps them use mm -hmm. it to just better their emotional well being as an entrepreneur. Yeah, well, I'm curious because so many people right now are probably a lot like yourself trying to figure out their next path, maybe yeah. because they were yeah. laid off, furloughed, right. or just realizing right. I can't, I don't want to do this whenever <laughs> COVID's over. I still don't want to go back to my job. Like I need to find that right entrepreneur job that they can do or become an entrepreneur. Uh, when you had those failures, oh, it's a quote, um, how did you know, okay, I need to change. This isn't working and not because so many times they make it seem like you, like your dreams, you really have to work hard for it and to really get um, like it, you hear both sides. Like you have you hear that you have to work 24 seven to get what you want. But at the same time, you'll also hear if it's meant for you, it'll be easy. It'll just not easy, but it'll, the opportunities will come if it's meant for you, you'll know type of thing. So right. what was it for you that was like, okay, let me pivot and try something else. Or this is definitely what I need to do. And just the hard times or good times, I need to keep doing this. Well, it was for me, happiness is the barometric mm -hmm. marker, right? Because if we are doing something and we're doing it with like anger and like you're dreading it and that's not for you, that, that's, that's not the thing for you. Right. You know, so for me, I had to feel it first to know, okay, this is for me. 
So if I didn't feel happy doing it, that was number one sign that like pivot. Mm -hmm. The other thing was to ask myself, if you weren't getting paid for this, could you get up every single day and be happy doing this? Mm -hmm. And what was it about this particular company or this particular industry that brings you that happiness? Mm -hmm. So those are my two markers. Yeah. So what about publicity makes you happy? You know, I think it's it's a challenge part, right? There's a challenging part because if we go back to the overachiever in me, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, every client is a different challenge. Every client has a different story. And every client needs to have a different set of way you communicate with them. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think that is the fascinating part because I'm also certified in neurolinguistic programming. So the I love that from um, Tony Robbins. Yes, yes. My yes, parents yes, yes. used to listen to his CDs as a kid, so that's why I know neurolinguistic programming. Oh, great! Okay, yeah. tell me more. Sorry. No, I didn't no. So you could be certified in. <laughs> it, it is. It's really cool, by the way. Okay. It's super cool. So you know, because I got certified in this, so it's it's very fascinating for me. The subconscious, the human subconscious mind. Um, what do they say? How do they say it? Their body language, the words that they're not using. Mm -hmm. to really understand people, right? I, th I think it's so fascinating because everybody's so different. Right. So, you know, I think that's the piece about PR is that you have, you're sure that your position is to pitch your clients, but you're also unsure what kind of client personalities you'll end up with, right? Mm -hmm. So it kind of feeds into our human, one of our seven human needs of like certainty and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what it provides for me. And that's why I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And you know, the other thing is you get to also create something from nothing, right? So your clients are like, I have a crazy idea. And you as a publicist are like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, no, no, no. And then when you actually do make it a actual reality, it's really fulfilling. Okay. Wow. I can imagine yeah. how with your job as the diamonds, like you were saying, there's a lot of adrenaline. There's a lot of adrenaline probably with the publicity parts still where you're just on the edge, making sure you're connecting. Cause we were talking off air a little bit, like how it's 24 seven, keeping up with everything and making sure you're always shining your clients in the best light too, or oh, taking yeah. advantage of any opportunities you have to strategize against, I guess. Oh, but yeah. So at what point would you say that people should reach out and get a publicist and what all does a publicist do for those that yeah. are debating on getting one or I, a lot of times I'll meet up and coming actors and they don't know whether they need to get the manager or a publicist or um, marketing people, a lawyer, like there's so many different people that need to be in their team. And I'm curious at what step do you suggest and what can they gain from having a publicist as well? I think it would vary from person to person, depending on what stage of your career you're at, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're at a point where you do have something substantial that your publicist or future publicist can kind of grasp hold of to pitch you for stories and things like that, major projects you've done with major brands, then you know, I think it would be time to start considering having a publicist or if you're looking to gain publicity for your business or your personal brand, then it's definitely time to consider a publicist, right? So when it comes to publicists, you also have to know, you know, the publicist, what they do as far as how their style is, if it works for you. Because every publicist has their own style. Every publicist will have their own way of communicating with you. Mm -hmm. So it's important for you to also feel out the publicist to see if you guys gel and, you know, ask questions. I think it's really good to ask questions. Don't just sit there and, you know, take it all in, take it all in. And then you go home and you're like, uh, now what? I don't know. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> right. ask, ask yeah. questions. I think okay. it's really good to create that that connection you know you have to be able to have that connection with your publicist because publicity is a is, is sort of intimate if you think mm -hmm. about it mm -hmm. because your publicist is telling your story and your story is unique to you and it's also very special to you so you can't just allow anyone to just tell your story because some people might not be able to tell the story the way you would want them to tell the story right right so yeah now, when it comes to creating the story, do you suggest, because like, even with people coming up with their own brands or um, being the brand, even 
they might not really know what does that mean? I don't know. Like even like, for instance, for myself, I think about this all the time. I know what kind of brand I hope I project, but at the same time, maybe that's not how I'm received. And so as a publicist, do you ever have those moments where you have to maybe coerce, not coerce, but maybe like that you fit more in this area or do you just follow whatever they, whatever their brand theme or whatever it is that they bring to the table? Or do you try to kind of um, gear them to a different direction if you know that would be more beneficial? Yeah, definitely. There are times that we will do that, right? Mm -hmm. And there's clients who, for example, might be involved in four or five different industries for, mm -hmm. you know, maybe fashion and then, you know, motivational speaking or, you know, whatever it is. So you need to almost sometimes you have to craft stories for each of these industries. Okay. Because the way you approach press about a motivational speaker is much different than you approach someone who is an actor or a model or hosting a show. Right. But if this is something that this one person does seven of these things, you have to be able to either craft different stories or learn how to pull them all together as one. It's, um, the first publicist I ever met. Uh, well, maybe she wasn't the first one. Now that I think about it. But the first public first publicist I ever met was Cassandra Butcher. And it was on a film set. And I was like, this has to be the coolest job ever. Because she like you said, she had to narrate those stories and get the excitement for the movie before it even um, came out and right. being a movie buff, I was like, what a cool job. And then I was working at a spa in LA and they had a publicist for the spa. And I was like, what does a spa need a publicist for? It's interesting how many different industries or people, small businesses do need a publicist. So what would be some of the um, signs even, or not signs, but what kind of industries do you think benefit the most from having a publicist, especially right now with COVID going on in the pandemic, like so many things that I'm sure have changed and maybe many more opportunities have opened since there's uh, more podcasts being made, it seems. Uh, so for you, what? how do you feel about um, who really needs a publicist or what industries should look into it? I think across the board, every industry would need PR, right? Okay. Across the board. And right now, more so, I think it's a great opportunity because if you kind of start paying attention, a lot of these companies, they're cutting costs, right? Mm -hmm. So they're like, okay, we don't need PR. And they'll cut out the PR budget, which is great because then it gives the next business who has the budget to put towards their PR to really amp up their game. And mm -hmm. they have the ability to reach more press because it's one less person in the competitive landscape. Okay. that's pitching this journalist, right? right. So mm -hmm. I think this is like a great opportunity to start looking at PR, you know, just because we are going through one of the toughest moments in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I also think that there's opportunities within this, right? So, you know, for example, health tech is really big right now and they're scrambling to figure out how do we, you know, PR this, what do we do? What's the next step? You know, it's a very, very new industry that's just being pulled into the forefront because of circumstances. Mm -hmm. So I think that every industry could use PR. It's just a matter of timing when you decide to pick up a PR company or agency or a publicist. Now, you mentioned earlier that you got, with your company that you guys are very specific on the types of people that you want to work with. Why, why do you choose those types? And can you share again what they are just in case somebody joined late? <laughs> Yeah. So for our agency, we like to work with personalities and talents who have an inspirational story. So one of the favorite types of clients that we like to represent is the underdog, right? The one that went from rags to riches or had to claw their way out and is super successful now. And the reason why we like that is because if we are a agency that is telling stories worth sharing, these are stories that are worth sharing. And as as well, these individuals, I think a lot of times get overlooked mm -hmm. because they're not a, let's say Nike, they're not a major brand, you know, endorsed, you know, they're not in the mainstream, let's say like a Cardi B collab, they didn't do anything like that. So a lot of people and agencies will overlook them because they just don't either A, believe in them or just don't know that how best to kind of position them in the marketplace, right? Mm -hmm. So I think people who are underdogs have a fascinating story. And the other thing is their work ethics 
is mm -hmm. unparalleled, unparalleled. So, you know, that's why I like working, you know, our agency loves working with people like that. They're really quick to respond and, you know, they're just, yeah. they're, they're there, they get it. You know, they're, they're ready to, to work alongside you and there's no ego. It's not like I'm better than you, you're better than me, right? So right, it's, right. it's great. So this is why we specifically are geared towards that type of clientele. Okay, now uh, since you've worked in this industry for three years now, I'm curious, has there been any incidences where you had, because it seems like every day someone is getting their foot in their mouth or a brand is being um, noticed for making missteps, whether it's Gucci, H&M, you know, there's been so many incidences where negative publicity and press, and there's that saying, there's no bad press or there are, all press is good press or so on, but it's with cancel culture, that's kind of changing a little bit. So I'm curious, have you had any issues where you had to kind of fix those kinds of things? And do you have any suggestions for people uh, like they probably should have a publicist before they get in trouble, but in, just in case, like how do they even, cause it's funny. I'm having a guy Monday who is um, an online person. Um, he does online like reputation management, probably. Yes, yes. Okay. I was like, not personality management, reputation management. And I was just so fascinated by the idea of how he can clean up their online presence. So I'm curious if there have been any incidences or even people who maybe not realize the publicist will help with that. What, what yeah. how do you handle those situations? And that's part of the reason why we work with inspirational okay talents and clients right because they know they know what's it like to be at the bottom they know what's at risk of them losing so they're more likely to be on point with how they are going to position themselves in public when they speak what they say mm -hmm. how they interact so they're much more careful right as opposed to somebody who is maybe a little bit more reckless i mean every publicist will go through their own special scenarios, let's put it that way, their own <laughs> special scenarios of crisis management, PR crisis management, right? Mm -hmm. And luckily for us, you know, our team is very on the ball. So we do a lot of Google scouring. We do a lot of social media scouring okay. just to see if our clients are up to date, up to par, what they're saying is good, what they're saying is not good. If something needs to come down, it needs to come down right away before mm -hmm. it gets 7 million views or you know, we will definitely be proactive. And mm -hmm. what's great is a lot of our clients will even ask us, you think this is good to post? Should I post something like this? Should I not? You know, how would you word this? And mm -hmm. it's really good that they take the initiative. Mm -hmm. It means they care right. and they're not just doing it for the gram for <laughs> follows, right? Yeah. yeah so, yeah. you know, I think it, you have to be very careful in today's climate and be very, very considerate of the fact that you're not the only one who is going to be seeing this post mm -hmm. or you, you know, video. And if your messaging as a brand and as a person is all about, let's include everybody. Let's be, you know, open to, to all races, all cultures and all that, then your content needs to reflect that. And I think that's really important. I think that's number one, right? And a lot of people, they forget that because they're busy with life and this and that, and they just never thought about it. But I think this is time to readjust the way we kind of look at the world. Mm -hmm. You know, the way you and I grew up was in different times. You know, what was acceptable and not acceptable is completely different back then than it is now. Absolutely. You know, so I think it's important that, you know, a lot of people before they get that publicist, you know, go online, do a little audit of yourself. If you have to clean up some of your content, clean it up because there are publicists out there who won't rep you if you're like sloppy all over the place and you have content that's inappropriate. Mm -hmm. There are publicists like that too. And I don't blame them either. No, I mean, that's a lot of work for them <laughs> that they probably don't want to touch with a 10 foot pole. And I, I think about all these different companies, how, um, with the Black Lives Matter movement, how they made all these black squares and then went right back to business as usual. And it just, it's, it spoke even more about how quickly people will just go right. things for the trend, like you were mentioning earlier, and not really have the substance about it. So I love that you're making sure that the clients you rep and that you're dealing with are people that 
actually do the work and really do care because it's so disheartening when you're when you're yeah. well you can relate as a person of color as well that when you look at these people using you almost as a marketing or publicity toy right. but not really trying to change right. the narrative or the culture where right. they work and uh, like including more people of color in executive roles or in um, their social media or just even looking for stock photos that might be more realistic and just include more um, people in it or from different cultures and genders or whatever it may be. But um, I'm curious how, what's going to be the backlash of some of that with some of these people who just used it as a prop to play along mm. and then people are starting to yeah. discover, oh yeah, they yeah. didn't really mean it. <laughs> or, you know, the people who are reaching out now to people of color, like, hey, we want you, but just as a token, they don't really want you to make any decisions. Right. Or, right. So. right. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, mm -hmm. I think this is something that was or is the LGBTQ community. They deal with this too. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, the handicap community deals with this too. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, they'll say that, you know, they just companies and brands are just checking the box. Right. Just to right. say, we got, we got we this person, quota. we got, yeah. we met a quota. Right. And, you know, as much as it's sad, you know, I think the conversation has to shift, but mm -hmm. I think the intent is what's important. Okay. The intent, right? And a lot of these companies might, like you said, don't have the intention. They're just doing it as, oh, it's trending. It's mm -hmm. a publicity stunt. It's because everyone's doing it. We have to do it too. Mm -hmm. But you will also see companies who are actively asking questions mm -hmm. and asking how they can make this different. And those are the companies that I would suggest paying attention to. Yeah, me too. Not the ones who are just like, let's just check the box. Yeah. Like checking the box is easy. Mm -hmm. Anyone can check the box, but this is not what we're here for. We're here for real change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was um, very disappointed with one of the brands I work with where I was like, huh, since I'm already working with you guys, you know, and everything's going mm -hmm. on, let's try that. You know, I, I extended the olive branch and then cricket. So I was like, oh. And then I looked at their social media feed. I'm like, ooh, you know, <laughs> they probably don't really care. <laughs> so I'm better off not even um, putting, being that token for them because it wouldn't have been a continuation of what they want to do. And it doesn't look like it's something they, they really were into. So uh, yeah, I was like, huh. I'll go where I'm celebrated, not where I'm tolerated. So like moving forward, with publicity and things going with the pandemic, have you noticed any differences or changes that with your job that you have to, I mean, I don't, I don't know what, how it might work for you, but just what are some of the big changes that have happened with um, the pandemic and not really having in studio interviews so easily, or even be able to do press as quickly or easily as it used to be, maybe, I don't know, but I'm curious, how has it changed for you? I mean, the number one thing is live events, right? Mm -hmm. Live events has taken a complete toll, you know, during the pandemic. And a lot of us as publicists, we rely on live events in the sense that, you know, obviously to get our clients there to be seen, to be photographed with certain, mm -hmm. you know, VIPs or A-listers or things like that. And, with events completely demolished right now, you know, that's something that's been a big challenge for us, you know, trying to figure out how do we pivot from that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the first thing is live events is completely the biggest challenge right now. And, you know, for us, a lot of the publications have been laying people off a lot right. of the blogs and, radio you know, happening. the radio stations. So now it's like certain categories they used to cover, they no longer cover now. Mm. And, you know, that's about COVID too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's been like some of the challenges is figuring out who's handling what beat and, you know, are they still there? So mm. those are probably the two biggest things that we're dealing with. Yeah, I didn't think of the live events for publicity as well because you know, right. all the red carpets and yes. all the yes. speaking yes. events. Because I, mean, right. I feel kind of lucky in some ways where location is no longer an issue. I don't have to fly to everything anymore. I can just zoom in, you know, but I didn't right, right. forget about, oh, yeah, I guess for the um, speakers or 
the celebrities there, they don't get the free clothes to wear either to show yeah. off or, <laughs> you know, true. That's true. Yeah. so even like with the fashion budget, yeah. you know, that would uh, um, have an issue because uh, like High Point Furniture Market is one of our big events here that I always attend. And I, yeah, I don't know how they're going to do it because I think they're getting ready to do a virtual ish kind one, but furniture is one of those things you kind of need to touch it and feel it to really know what you're getting to some extent. So this should be interesting. Yeah. yeah I mean, I went to a virtual boat show mm. and it was luxury boats, yachts. Mm -hmm. And it was really fascinating because you actually got 365 view. You can actually like walk on the ship and like open up stuff and go into oh, rooms. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. So yeah. I thought that was well done. Yeah, uh, technology is helping again. I saw yeah. one of the networking things I go to, this guy created an app to teach doctors how to, um, I, don't, I don't know the exact term, but to go down their throats basically. And right. he's teaching how to do it now to protect yourself as much as possible from COVID. So it's like a, a I mean, virtual reality type of thing. The app, you could wow. play it on your desk where you see it almost 3D type of thing. It was really wow. freaking cool. And it was a free app. So I was like, Oh, I'm downloading it for myself to play. <laughs> but like, you, um, Oh, then well, I don't know what the term is, but you can um, do all these different things. So they're learning that who knows what they'll come up with as far as for live events. Cause I went to one, I think it was a media event actually where it was interesting. Cause it was like a bird's eye view of a patio and like you had different circles represented different people and it showed their profile picture and you could kind of interact, Ooh. but it was a lot of noise at the same time. Like it wasn't, you only heard the person you bump type of thing, but it was still like, this is interesting. Like I can see where, what they were trying to accomplish. And there was a DJ playing as well. It oh, was wow. interesting. Oh, um, wow. It was very interesting. So there's a lot of technology out there. Who knows what they'll come up with. Cause even, with um, fashion shows, there the lady that did the artificial intelligence model, yes, where she, the entire show. Um, I'm blanking on the lady's name, but all you saw was the. I'm sure you saw it where all yeah, the different dresses were just yes. flowing without a body, so to speak. And then um, I want to say um, Ralph and Russo, they are doing one where they created a avatar just for mm -hmm. the dress and stuff. And I'm like, yeah. wait, get real models. So you could just ship all of that to one model and have her like, just like Naomi Campbell did for Vogue, iPhone right. picture it up. But right. I, don't know, I guess I should be thankful it's a person of color that they used. <laughs> but, you know, here we are. So I'm curious, what do you think moving forward would you like to see happen as far as with publicity or PR, even like other ideas maybe for live events or other ways to kind of... Um, I guess, strategize during this time when it's all Zoom or not in person? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, you know, with PR, the biggest challenge is always getting your client in front of the right publications, right? Mm -hmm. And usually for us as publicists, we would have to pay a lot of money to somehow sometimes acquire lists and things like that, right? So mm -hmm. I would just wish that it would be more open in, in some way for us to have that access to a lot of these journalists much easier, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it goes with the territory, right? It goes with the territory. And I think, you know, as publicists, minority publicists aren't celebrated as much. And I think that we as minorities need to be celebrated no matter what country background you're from. And, you know, I think with everything that's going on right now, it's a slow course of action mm -hmm. and we're getting there, we're yeah. getting there. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's just, it's really interesting because, and the reason why I bring this up is a couple of days ago and I was on Instagram and I put in the hashtag Asian founder, mm. just out of curiosity. Okay. And there was only a hundred posts attributed to that. Huh. I'm like, this is interesting. Yeah. So it reminded me of something that I think Robert Kiyosaki says, he's like, why does the C student, um, the, a, the A student work for the C student or something like that? Like the C student was like the boss and the A student, you know, a, in school, the A student was working for the C student and they're, 
you know, it was just, it was really fascinating to see that because mm-hmm. it's just like, it just still shows you that we still have a way to go. Yeah. And, you know, I think in the PR space, minority PR needs to be celebrated. It really does. Well, and I'm hoping to see that. Well, what, cause you never know who's watching. What kind of support or what would you like celebrate it in what way, what can we do to help? Well, you know, I think a lot of minority owned public relations companies are small. So of course, you know, the funding aspect is always super important. You know, mentorship is always super important. You know, in PR, there's really not a lot of, at least that I know of, there's not a lot of people who are like, sure, I'll mentor you, Mm -hmm. right? Outside of interning for major PR agencies, you're kind of like at your whim, figuring it out, you Google it, you YouTube it, and then you ask a friend to phone a friend to phone a friend. Okay. And it's the wrong information, right? So <laughs> it happens, it happens. Yeah, right. So I think, you know, education wise helping, you know, because a lot of the next generations want to do PR. Mm-hmm. And we have to pa- pass the torch to somebody as publicists. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think it's up to us to try to see how we can make that change. So I think, you know, part of celebration would be more funding available to public relations agencies, you know, in the form of government grants or I don't know, private grants, Um, even mentorship for a lot of the PR space would be fantastic because there's PR agencies or publicists who want to do PR, but don't get the business side or vice versa. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think mentorship is super important, super important. I would agree with that. Cause it's funny when I was working at the spa with the publicist, I loved her job. And I was just like, that's what I want to do. And I remember just like kind of asking her questions every day after work a little bit more just to learn what, it, cause it seems so glamorous compared to what I was doing as an esthetician. <laughs> Although I loved being an esthetician, like if I could, I would do it right now, but carpal tunnel and other body issues <laughs> have made it impossible to do any more manual labor right. jobs. But um, it just, I mean, it, you still got to talk about skincare and uh, like you were able to introduce it to other people and she would do different things with different radio stations, giveaways. And like I had the opportunity to work on um, Jennifer L- J Lo's music video, and so she gave me gift bags to bring to J Lo and stuff. Like it was just like I felt like it was really a cushy, fun job. And um, she seemed to make her own hours because she just kind of came in whenever she wanted, type of thing, too. And I was like, oh, I love this California carefree life. Right. <laughs> you know, compared to I just come sweating out of a room from steaming and cleaning this yeah. third or fifth person today with acne here which I love too. I miss. I really miss. I mean, thank God for Dr. Pimple, Pimple Popper because that can feed some of my need for um, extractions. But there are times where I'm like, come here, honey. <laughs> let me practice on you. Or my mom, well, yeah, she'll let me ex- extract on her. I still have a spa oh, room funny. with all right. my equipment still. But um, I'm just curious like what we can do in general. Just I, I think a lot of fields with women, we're kind of pitted against each other because there can only be so many women at the top or in certain industries. Like we we're kind of, I don't want to say conditioned, but I guess it's conditioned where we're more competitive as opposed to collaborative. And I think there's so many different industries right now that because they're home, because of the pandemic, it would be so easy to help each other now and just kind of build that empire so to speak (laughs) or you're working with all these different women like because maybe there's certain industries you enjoy more that you would be your specialty and you could just like well she likes to do medical or she's over here she likes to do athletes or whatever that you guys would be able to cross promote each other as well and so i'm curious what more um how those conversations can even happen or what we can do to kind of change the narrative about the opportunities not being out there or even, I guess, creating more mentorships as well because there's so many kids now who are home too as well. That yeah. I, even though yeah. they might be in school, there's, you know, there's access to <laughs> in between Zoom classes that they might be able um, to be available. So I'm just curious what else you would suggest. 
you know, I think one of the biggest thing is in the PR in every industry, they have those like associations and forums and, you know, mm -hmm. membership is like a million dollars. Right. So <laughs> yeah, I think I, yeah, having I a, a yeah, having some sort of forum for the public relations space that is affordable or that is reasonable, mm -hmm. I think that would be a fantastic start, you know, especially with what's going on right now. Not everybody has residual income or, you know, an extra thousand dollars laying around to just sign up for membership, right? So having that forum where publicists can ask each other questions and see how do you do this? And, and you know, those are things that are really, really helpful, I think, for publicists. There are a few out there, but I would love to see, you know, more of them because publicists from different parts of the world might bring a different perspective, right? Oh, so. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's always super key. And the mentorship part is always super important as well. I'm a firm believer in that. And I don't know if I told you, but I also mentor teen entrepreneurs. Oh. So, oh, yeah, you yeah. Said some updates for me today as well. So we make sure we talk about that as well. Yes, 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 we will. Okay. So, you know, teen entrepreneurs and, you know, some of the things that I've seen in that space is that they're afraid to ask these questions sometimes. Mm. And you know, it kind of trickles over to us as adults, mm -hmm. too, in a way, because if you're in a certain industry, you don't want to ask that question. If you say I'm a publicist, but you want to ask PR questions, you don't want people to think you're not knowledgeable as a Our publicist. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think having those safe spaces for us as publicists to ask these questions would be fantastic. So if anybody wants to create something, let me know. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think there's some Facebook groups. I'll have to see if there's any that we're not both already in. <laughs> Because yeah. I'm sure you join a lot of the public because I join them just just as because sometimes they'll pitch whatever their um, newest client really quickly. Like, oh, right. I wasn't aware of this person or different things. So I enjoy it from that standpoint. But I am a member of um, the National Association of Black Journalists, and it includes publicists in media, oh, um, like podcasts yeah. and all of those different things. And I'm curious, is there one for the Asian community? Or not that I know of. Look like Connie's got something to do. <laughs> There's gonna be an Asian journalist association coming up and maybe include PR well or make might it be PR include because um although I don't locally I haven't seen a lot of uh collaboration in that sense with the publicist and media from what I can tell. It seems like he still has to jump through all the hoops to get pitches and so on. And it's kind of like, dude, you guys are right here in the same meeting. Why? Yeah. Right. I yeah, yeah. 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 That's one of the biggest hurdles. Right. And then mm -hmm. that same journalist gets like a thousand emails every single day mm -hmm. and you're just hoping and praying that this person opens your email. Right. Right. And um, so. even for myself where I was just noticing, cause I was in radio first and like, we would have different guest speakers come in and it was like a perfect opportunity to pitch them to be on my show and so on. But there was times when I just was like, why aren't you guys working together? <laughs> just because you're at different stations, like you could so easily like strategize together. And cause right. you may be at this station today, but next month right. you could be, <laughs> you know, like things change so frequently that I've, right. I guess from working in the film industry, since a very young age and my parents working in it, you just knew that yesterday's PA could be tomorrow's director. Mm -hmm. Like it's just that quickly things can change because you don't know that that PA happens to be a USC film student who's just getting his foot in the door and now he's creating movies. Like you, right. know, like, you right. just really never know. So it's very 100%. important to- 100%, yeah. So like, why, why is it always the women um, women-centered professions that tend to not want to work as sisters sometimes, but we're going to change that. Yeah. Change yeah. That. Now there's Very a time good. we're having these conversations. So tell us your latest updates because it's time flies so fast. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So my latest update is there is a organization that is very, very dear to my heart that I and I'm truly loving them and I truly support them. It's called the Avery Project. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. I so Avery Project is mm -hmm. based out in California and they are actually helping kids really in a very unique way, you know, emotional level whose parents are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And I think that organizations like this need to have more shine and 
you know, that's why I've been supporting them. And I think that it's just brilliant because a lot of times we don't think about these kids, what they go through. Right. right and, right. and they're innocent. Yeah. And they're so innocent. They're so innocent and they don't know where to turn. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think this organization is amazing. It's a wonderful organization. So if you guys get a chance, you know, check them out. Yeah. How do you spell love it? I just want to make sure I'll type it in the comments. Avery, A-V-A-R-Y and then project. Just like the label. Mm -hmm. So check them out, support them follow them. Okay. What are some of the things yeah. that they're doing? Like what, how can we, I mean, always money, but what are they? Right. That's like anybody, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, obviously money, but um, for those that don't have the money aspect, but what, what exactly are they looking for helping? How are, what exactly are they doing with, um, is it like a, so they have like a support system. Okay. They have some like support system um, right now. Obviously with COVID, everything is done digitally on Zoom. So they have a support system for the kids and it's tightly like guarded because these kids, you have to be very protective of them, right? They're already in a delicate space. So sometimes they get together to discuss challenges or, you know, they have special speakers that come in to just kind of give them that support that they need. So they do a whole lot of different things. Um, you know, pre-COVID, from what I understand, they were doing uh, sort of like retreats at some point where the kids yeah, would get I went together. To the website. It looks like camp almost. It looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, it's. I think it's a great space for for these kids. So yeah, if you guys can just support them, you know, they would be great, great, great. Yeah, and they're looking for mentors as well. Mm -hmm. Which is great. Oh, and I see they do things with horses. <laughs> my poor daughter we used to she used to take horse lessons and then um, oh nice uh, oh not for the checkbook not for the checkbook it is not cheap and the lessons were very far and with school and everything it was almost impossible oh, wow. so wow. every time i see a horse i'm always like heartbroken that we couldn't keep it up but uh, one day um so I'm glad that they're getting that opportunity there as well. And so many other different things they look like they're involved in, but I'm sure now everything would be Zoom related, but that's right. one of those things that I hear a lot about with these different networking events I go to where they really need to help with the digital divide as well. So I'm sure that's something that they probably would need for some of these kids that might not have access to computers or internet at home. And now with virtual learning right. could be getting really far behind, which would be another thing that would be a hurdle for them to have to, or right. a challenge, or depending on how you want to look at it, um, for them to overcome and I'm sure if there's any techies out there as well, this is a great project to help get involved with as well. I always think about yeah. that because my mom uh, lives in a very rural area. And if I was a kid now, I would not have ha access to high speed internet. I would not be able to Google quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I would still have to require yeah. encyclopedias probably <laughs> to get my <laughs> schoolwork done because it's right. great for what she likes to do. She's an artist. So she likes the resort life and um, being away from people at the same time. So it's perfect for her. But for a lot of kids right now, I, I think about that. So with that. Oh, one, yeah, definitely. Can, yeah. Can you imagine helpful. if like they had to go back to it's like in the library card days? <gasps> No. Or remember, like, you had to pull out yeah. the drawer and you go through the cards to, like, find which aisle. No, I'm dyslexic. It. That was a nightmare for me every time. Oh, I'm sure. I would write yeah. it down, but then I might not write it down correctly. And so now I'm looking down the aisles and I had to come like up with a way to kind of memorize what was where for my major when I was, because the college libraries are huge. And yeah, it was. Very frustrating. I really hated it. I'm really glad computers exist. Because <laughs> my parents got me like Encarta CD encyclopedia. It wasn't the same as Google, but that's no. what we had too. If you remember yeah, those. yeah, yeah. I remember those. Yep. Oh, I remember. I am dating myself too. Yeah. So. <laughs> it was my um, at my grandparents' house. <laughs> Probably still there, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, my grandmother still had her rotary phone, like just as. <gasps> It wasn't usable, but just as like a reminder that right. things could be off. Things change quickly, thankfully. <laughs> right. Like that. Right. Uh, 
Well, it's been wonderful chatting with you and learned so much about Felicity yeah. and diamonds, which is always fun. Yeah. And I want to make sure that people know where is the best place to reach out to you if they're interested in learning more about your practice or even hiring you as a publicist where they can reach you. Yeah. So you can check out my Instagram, right? Everything's Instagram now, right? It's <laughs> underscore Connie, C-O-N-N-I-E dot C-H-I underscore. Or you can just scope out our website, the Chi Group, T-H-E-C-H-I G-R-O-U-P dot co, C-O, like commanding officer. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. I love it. Well, thanks again for being my guest today. And I hope you have Absolutely. a lot of great fun for planned for the rest of the week. Thank yeah. you. You're Same. Like, Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you. Oh, it was my pleasure. I always enjoy speaking to strong women like yourself and just getting more inspiration. So, and I'm sure. Same here. Audience as well. So. Absolutely. All right. You have a good one. You too. Bye now. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed having Connie as my guest today. She had so many great stories. I had no idea about wearing all those diamonds. Like I think in my head, that just seemed like the coolest thing ever. But I, yeah, I would have given all the diamonds away if somebody was um, going to kill me over them. Like, I'm not that girl. So glad I never got into that industry as a job because <laughs> uh, yeah, blood diamond. I'm not the girl. Anyway, moving on tomorrow, another great group of ladies will be here. The tunnel twins, Denise and Janice tunnel will be here from illusions cosmetics, but they've worked on every film pretty much or TV show that's made in Atlanta. Uh, they're um, the sweet, Oh, gosh, I just forgot the name, and I've been watching it. Sweet Magnolia is one of the shows they've been working on. Um, they worked on Step Up with Naya Riviera. Uh, I met her from working underneath her at um, Hustle and Flow, so I haven't – I've seen her only once or twice since then, and I always love chatting with her every chance I get because once a glam girl, always a glam girl. And hanging out in the Glam Squad trailer is probably the most fun – that there is on film sets. Just going to go ahead and put that out there. Sorry, grip guys. It's the camera, um, the makeup trailer that's having the most fun. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone for tuning in tonight. Make sure you tune in tomorrow at six o'clock, 3 PM um, Pacific time. I will be here with the tunnel twins and make sure you follow me on Instagram, subscribe to my YouTube channel as well. Cause a lot of new technology stuff was released recently, and I might try to test out how YouTube works, especially when playing music to see if they're as quick to cancel because we might have some fun things coming up because if you can believe it or not, I started this show March 25th, and in August, I will have re reached my 100th show. It does not seem like I've done 100 shows, but yeah, I'm at 87 as of today, so next month. And I might have to double check my counting because, uh, like I said, I'm dyslexic. So, because I, I thought I had 87 a couple of weeks ago. And yeah, I was rewriting and going through all my stuff. So, just to be safe, it's in August. Not exactly sure what date, just to make sure that I meet the 100 mark. But I want to try to do something kind of fun. So, if you have any ideas or any suggestions for people to interview for the 100, because part of me is like, I should bring back maybe one of your favorite um, guests and have them back on for the hundredth episode, or maybe just do a fun little party and just chat it up. And um, maybe one of you guys that's an audience member can be my guest. I don't know. I'm, I'm taking ideas. I'm taking suggestions. So if you have any, send them on over. Uh, you can message me here on Facebook or Instagram at the real Camille Cower on Instagram and YouTube just look to for YouTube Camille Cower and I'll come up. All right. Thanks again for being my guest and I hope you have a great rest of your day and make sure you share, like, and comment. Don't let me be the best cup secret.